Tuka Joe here. We're getting ready for turn four, 1860 here in the great game. We've seen how the British have uh, conquered their neighbor vassal states, Baluchistan, Punjab, Afghanistan, and then when they ventured into Bokhara, things did not go so well. And uh, the Russians now control that vassal state. And uh, the British only have one officer on the board, and that's Abbott. The Russians, on the other hand, have three, and they will be receiving a very able military commander in this turn. Both sides have forces in uh, Bokhara. The Russians have seven strength points under Kanikov there. The British have eight. They don't have uh, a leader, but Abbott is nearby. But you can see that Abbott is not a great military commander, and neither are any of the Russian, Russian officers there. But the Russian officer that is about to enter play is the best in the game, as we will see. The Russians can use their uh, advantage in officers to play emissary cards and bring Kokand, as well as the Kazakhs, to uh, the Russian camp. And that may tie the score and victory points. The British with few officers can only hope to draw rebellion cards and or imperial commitment cards to uh, force the Russians to send some of their uh, military forces back to Russia. So on we go to the fourth turn, 1860. And the only officer that enters play in this turn is Chernyayev with a score of four in tactics. So this is uh, the best uh, military leader in the game. And he enters play in Khorasan, Persia. So we shuffle the deck and deal seven cards to each of the sides. Let's take a look at each of the hands. Gunboat Diplomacy, again, the Flashman card. Persian Persuasion. Pen Mightier Than Sword. And three spoiler cards. That's a lot of spoiler cards. Now with three spoiler cards, chances are that the Russians won't have many. So the British will discard two spoiler cards. And they draw two emissary cards. And this certainly uh, changes the strategy to uh, attempt to persuade the Persians to revert to neutrality using that Persian persuasion card and through the play of the flashman officer who if played for the text, he will return to the game. Now to the Russian hand, a campaign card, Rebellion, and that can be very useful. Martini Henry Rifles and Krupp Guns, the event, still not playable in this turn. Shooting Leave, the Crimean War card, so we may see, after all, combat between both Imperial powers. Persian Persuasion, that doesn't have much use for the Russians, and a spoiler card. The Russians choose to keep the Persian Persuasion card. After all, it has a value of two actions. But in this turn, a successful play of a rebellion in Afghanistan and a push by the Russians here in Bokhara towards Afghanistan may leave Russian forces near the border with Baluchistan. So we begin with round one. Each side selects a card and both play Persian Persuasion but because the die roll is odd the Russians will have the initiative and go first. 
And of course, Persia is currently a proxy of the Russians, so they will not play the card for the event, but only for two actions. For the first Russian action, Chernayev and six Persian strength points at Khorasan. March to Herat. And note that the Russians have to leave the Russian strength point at Khorasan because uh, the Crimean War card is not in effect. So the Russians have to do the fighting with Persian allies. The British have four strength points of British Imperial forces. So they roll one die. The Russians have six strength points of Persian forces led by Russian officer. They roll two dice. So the British roll first. The roll is a three. Four British strength points minus three cause a loss of one strength point on the Persian force. And we remove the Persian strength point. Now it's the Russians turn. Fire back. They roll 2d6 and subtract 4 for Chernayev's tactics rating. The roll is a 5 modified to a 1. 5 Persian strength points minus 1 causes a loss of 4 on the British force and that's what the British have. 4 strength points so they are wiped out. So the British had conquered Herat and now the Russians liberated that vassal state. They have one round next round to leave or they will become the new invaders. So we roll for attrition for the uh, Persian force led by the Russians 10 plus 2, 12, no losses. Now for the second action, the Russians will move their strength point that is currently at Khorasan, and it will march to Herat to join Chernayev, and that's for the purpose of preventing the British from attacking Herat, because it contains Russian forces. So the Russian strength point reaches Herat, and no attrition die roll will be made, because it's impossible to achieve a result less than one. Now the British play the Persian Persuasion card, and they play it first for the event. And we'll go into some detail because you will see what happens here in this event. It says that during the decade in which this card is played, and we're in the 1860s, a British or Russia-aligned Persian, in this case a Russia-aligned Persia, will revert to neutrality when at least two spaces are occupied by the rival camp, by the British. And here we see the two spaces occupied by the British in Persia, Bushire and Bampur. So Prussia reverts to neutrality and we signify that by removing all Russian control markers from Persia. And of course there's more effects as the result of the play of this card. The card further reads that rival strength points in Persia may then transfer to any box in their country. And what rival means is Imperial Russian forces as well as British forces may transfer to any box in their home country. So this is optional, discretionary, not mandatory. And in our walk through the strength points that the British have in Bushire, and Bampur will transfer to uh, the British Raj. And there will be two in Bombay and four transferred to Delhi. Now continuing with our example, the Russians have strength points in Persia, one sole strength point in Isfahan, and the Russians may transfer that strength point to any box in their home country. Now, you would say, well, yeah, let's transfer the Russian strength point. Well, in the walkthrough, the Russian strength point is not transferred. So the Russians elect to leave it there. The next sentence reads, remove any Persian strength points from the map. There's two Persian strength points at Isfahan, so they're removed. 
And there's six with uh, Chernayev at Herat, so they are also removed. Now the Persians don't have any strength points in the map. And the last sentence states, transfer any imperial strength points in the vassal state's capital back to their home capital. There's no imperial strength points of either side in Tehran, so nothing has to be done in that respect. Now the second paragraph of Rule 8.4 kicks in. That rule deals with liberation. It reads, if your opponent liberates a vassal state, turning it neutral, which is what the British just did, and you are still within that country, in this case the Russians are still in Persia with one strength point, then you, in this case the Russians, become an invader of that vassal state. Any vassal state strength points are set up by the liberating opponent. And the rest of the rules deal with uh, instance in which case the opponent that liberates a vassal state leaves the capital before the end of the following round, not conquering it, but occupying a space. In that case, uh, the opponent would become the uh, invader. So, in our example, if the British played the card, but decided not to transfer their troops, and they don't capture the capital of Persia, in the next turn they become the invaders. But that didn't happen here. Here, the British, they transferred all their troops in Persia to their home country, which is the Raj, and Russia decided to leave one strength point at Isfahan. So that means now that Prussia still remains neutral, but its army is controlled by the British, because the Russian is the invader. Consequently, the Russian presence in Isfahan triggers the return of 20 strength points of Persian forces. Now, the Russians decide to transfer Simonich from Khorasan back to the Russian base at Orenburg. So, Persia is neutral. It is not a British proxy, but the British decide where the 20 strength points of Persian troops will be placed. And they are placed in Khorasan. And now, the British play the two actions of the Persian persuasion card. The British will divide the stack of 20 strength points into one of 13 and the other of 7. And the first action is used to move the stack of 13 Persian strength points to Herat, where the Russians have uh, Chernayev and one Russian strength point. Now we resolve combat, one Russian strength point, oh, but we have the uh, military prowess of Chernayev, which has a tactical rating of four, so we subtract four, so we roll 1d6. And the Russians roll a six, modified to a two. So the Russians do not cause any losses on the Persian force, and now the Persians are going to fire back. Persians have 13 strength points and they roll three dice. The roll is a 10, so 13 minus 10 equals three strength points lost by the Russians. Well, the Russians only have one and that strength point is gone. And the Russians lost all the strength points they had in battle. So as per the rules, the officers in that space are transferred to their capital. So we place Chernayev in Orenburg. And Herat, who is neither allied to the Russians or British, now reverts to neutral status. Now there's one action left, and the British will use that action to march the victorious Persian army from Herat to Merv, where it will attack another sole Russian strength point. The Russians fire first, they roll 1d6, but 
we won't even roll because the lowest die roll of one is not less than the number of strength points they have. So now we roll for the Persian force of 13 strength points. And it's another 10. 13 minus 10 is 3. So 3 strength points are lost by the Russians. They don't have 3. So their sole strength point is eliminated. And that ends the actions. And now we have to roll for attrition of the Persian force. And it moved over uh, regular terrain connection line. So we roll 2d6 and add 2. The roll is an 8 modified to a 10. There's 13 strength points. So 10 of those are safe. And the Persians lose 3 strength points to attrition. And that's the end of round number 1. And you've seen how the British have taken advantage of this rebellion. All because one Russian strength point was left in Persian territory. And now we move on to round number two. Each of the sides selects a card. Let's see what they are. The Russians play Rebellion, and the British, pen mightier than sword, the British go first. And the British will play the card first for its two actions. And the British see another opportunity to let the Persians do the fighting for them. So they will march Abbott, who's currently in Bokhara, to Merv. And he will lead the Persian forces there as they march into Bokhara to fight it out with the Russians. The British have 10 Persian strength points led by an imperial power officer, in this case Abbott. And the Russians have seven imperial strength points led by Kanikov. The Russians have imperial strength points, so they roll 1d6. And uh, the British only have one of their officers commanding vassal strength points, so they roll 2d6. So because the Russians roll less dice, they roll first. So the Russians roll 1d6. The roll is a 2, modified to a 1. 7 strength points minus 1 is a loss of 6 strength points on the Persian side. The Persians now only have 4 strength points left, and they roll 2d6. The roll is a 9, modified to an 8. So they cause no losses on the Russian force, and they must retreat. The Persian force marches back to Merv, and the attrition die roll is 5 plus 2, 7. They suffer no more losses. Now it's Russian round number 2. And the Russians play the Rebellion card, and they will play it for the event first. So they will target a conquered vassal state in uh, Russia's camp, and then roll 1d6, and if the result is three or more, that vassal state immediately rebels. The Russians target Afghanistan for this rebellion, and they roll 1d6. And the roll is a four. There will be a rebellion. Next, as stated in the rules, we roll 2d6, and that's the number of rebel Afghan strength points uh, that are going to be placed on the map by the Russian player. And also, for the first rebellion, uh, we will also set up rebel leader Akbar. And we can see here that with a tactics rating of three, this guy, Akbar, is a pain in the neck. So now we roll 2d6 to determine how many strength points of rebels appear. And the roll is a 10. So 10 strength points of rebels will be placed by the Russians in any of these Afghan spaces. The Russians decide to place them in Kandahar. And they are placed with their leader, Akbar. So now we're going to have combat between the Afghan rebels and the British strength points there. 
Looking again at the sequencing of combat here, here we have Imperial Strength Points, which are the British, so they roll one die. But we also have First Round Rebels. So the Rebels also roll one die. So both sides will roll and extract casualties simultaneously. So we roll 1d6 for each of the sides. The Russians rolled a 2 and we subtract Akbar's tactical rating so it's a net minus 1. So 10 strength points minus minus 1 is the same as saying 10 plus 1, 11. So the Afghan rebels destroy 11 British strength points, of course. The British only have three, so they're going to be wiped out. Now, the British rolled a three, and uh, three strength points minus three is zero. So they, they don't cause any loss on the Afghan force, and now the British are eliminated. And that concludes the first action by the Russians. The second action has the Russian garrison at Isfahan composed of one sole strength point marching on the Persian capital of Tehran which is a fortress with a strength of 10 and this is of course a suicidal attack the Russians won't even bother of rolling one die roll they cannot roll less than their strength now we roll for the Persian fortress three dice the die roll is an eight 10 minus 8, 2, so the Russian force is eliminated. So the Persians revert to neutrality. They're not fighting the Russians anymore because there's no Russian strength points in their country. So we have an invasion lapse. An invasion lapses if there's no longer any strength points from the invading camp in the vassal state at the end of a round. And in this case, the invader was the Russians, and there's no longer any Russian strength points in Persia, so the invasion has lapsed. Now, if an invasion lapses, like what happened here, and there are no foreign strength points from the rival camp, and there's no British strength points in Persia, because if they were, these would become the new invaders, then all officers and non-fortress strength points of that vassal state are immediately removed. Consequently, because there's no Russian strength points in Persia, now we remove all Persian strength points from the map. We start with those in Khorasan. And we remove the four Persian strength points with Abbott at Merv. Now we go to the last action point, and the Russians will transfer Ignatiev to Turkestan, where he may in the future, when reinforced, attack the fortress of Tashkent. And that's the last Russian action of this round. And the British finish their round two play by placing the pen miter than sword card in the space on the map for cards that have lasting effects because in round three the Russians will not be able to play any card for action but only for reinforcement. Now we move on to round three and both sides select a card. The Russians play shooting leave and the British the Flashman card. So the Russians have the initiative, they will play their card first. But because of the play of Pen Mightier Than Sword by the British in the previous round, the Russians can only play Shooting Leave for reinforcement. So the Russians will bring two strength points of Imperial troops. So the Russians receive two strength points at Orenburg. So the British play the Flashman card, and Flashman appears once again in any space under British control. And he shows up at Termes in Bokara. Now the British play the Flashman card for its three actions. The British take six of the nine strength points they have in Termes, and they march them 
to Herat, and that takes one action, and then to Merv, to join Abbott at the Turkomans. And they don't lose any strength to attrition. And the last action is used to move a four strength point force, which is in Delhi, to Sindh in Baluchistan. The attrition die roll is four plus two, six, so the force suffers no loss. So it looks like the British forces are gathering to crush the Afghan rebels. Now on to round four. And each of the sides will play a card. Let's see what those cards are. The Russians play a campaign card and the British an emissary, so the British have the initiative. The British see that bringing Bokara or Kokan into the British camp will be indefensible and a few officers that they have makes an approach on Persia too much of a risk if the Russians have a spoiler card. So, the British pass on playing the event and they will play the card for its sole action. So, the British will march Abbott and his column, composed of six strength points, across the desert into Giyok Tepe. And they will fight it out with the fortress there. And the attrition die roll of the desert terrain is 7 minus 1 is 6. And Abbott has 6 strength points, so 6 minus 6 is 0. It's a close call, but no strength points are lost in the desert march. So the British roll 1d6 first. The roll is a 5, reduced by 1 to 4 because of Abbott's tactics rating. 6 British strength points minus 4 equals 2 losses on the Giuseppe Fortress. The Fortress with a strength of 13, roll 3 dice and they roll 14, so they cause no losses on the British Force. And the British Force, having failed to reduce the Fortress completely, retreat back to Merv, and now they roll for regular attrition. Roll is a 9, no effect. Now it's the Russians' round, and they will play the campaign card for its four actions. The Russians form a column with Chernayev, Simonich, and the two strength points in Orenburg, and will use all four actions to march their way into Bokhara, and they'll have to uh, traverse the desert three times. So the first march is from Orenburg to Slavers across desert terrain. The desert attrition roll is 7 modified to a 6, so they make it safely with no loss. From there, they march across the desert again and make it to Kiva with no losses on account of desert attrition. The third action is used to reach Petro Petroandrovsk across regular terrain, and the fourth action is the last leg of the march to Bokara across the desert with no losses due to desert attrition. And we will not do a regular attrition die roll because there's no way they can get a number which is lower than two. Now to the fifth and last round of this turn. Each side selects a card. The Russians select Crimean War and the British gunboat diplomacy so the Russians have the initiative and go first. The Russians will use the card first for its actions in order to set up their forces to attack the British. And this is the only instance in which, in this game, Russian and British forces can enter each other's spaces and participate in combat. And uh, once this card is played for that purpose, it is removed permanently from the game. Russians have three officers and nine strength points in Bokara. They form an eight strength point column with Chernayev and Kanikov, and they will leave one strength point under Simonich at Bokara. And the Russian column advances 
into termes to battle it out with Flashman and his three strength points. Because each side consists of Imperial troops, each side will roll 1d6 and uh, we will subtract their commander's tactics rating and losses will be applied simultaneously. The Russians roll a 4 modified to a 0. So the Russians have 8 strength points. They cause a loss of 8 strength points on the British side, which will be wiped out. The British roll a 4 modified to a 2. They have 3 strength points. They cause one strength point of loss on the Russian force. Flashman withdraws to Kabul and the Russians pursue the British as part of their second action. Now we have another round of combat. The Russians roll a six modified to a two, seven strength points minus two. They cause a loss of five strength points, wiping out this second British force. The British Roll a 3, modified to a 1, and they cause a loss of 2 Russian strength points. Flashman retreats once again, this time to Peshawar. The attrition roll for the Russian column is 4 plus 2, 6. But they have 5 strength points, so they suffer no losses on account of attrition. So as we see now, the Russians have conquered Afghanistan, and Afghanistan had been previously conquered by the British. So what happens to the British control markers, the discontent markers, and the Afghan rebels that are in Kandahar? Well, let's take a look at the first paragraph of Rule 8.4 that has to do with liberation of previously invaded vassal states. A conquered vassal state, like in this case Afghanistan, is liberated if strength points rival to the conqueror. In this case, the conqueror was the British, so strength points rival to the conqueror are Russian strength points, solely occupy the capital. And that's the case right now. Or if the vassal state only contains rebel strength points, and that's not the case. A liberated vassal state reverts to neutrality and removes all its rebel strength points and officers, if any. So by reverting to neutrality, we first remove the British control markers. And we remove all rebel strength points and its officers, so Akbar and the rebel strength points in Kandahar are removed. Now, not stated in 8.4, but stated in the second paragraph of 9.2, a liberated vassal state removes all its discontent markers and any remaining rebel strength points. So, we also remove the three discontent markers in Afghanistan. Now, we continue. If the liberating strength points are rival strength points, which is the case, these are Russian strength points, then these foreign strength points must exit the capital by the end of the following round. So it's not the round when the liberation takes place, which is the fifth round of the 1860 turn. They have to leave by the first round of the 1870 turn, or the vassal state is again conquered by this new conqueror. And in that case, we would then place the discontent markers once again. And of course, the invader would be the Russians who, uh, uh, overextended their stay. So the Russians are right now liberators. And uh, they will be liberators as long as they leave Afghanistan in the next round. If they don't, they have overextended their welcome and become the new invaders. And now we discard permanently the Crimean War card because it was played for its event. So that means that for the rest of the game, uh, Russian and British Imperial strength points cannot move into each other's spaces nor attack each other. Now it's the British round five and they will play this card for its actions and they may, if they want, uh, move British strength points along the blue lines of the Persian Gulf during this round. The first action is used by the British to march one strength point from Lahore to Peshawar to uh, discourage or prevent the Russians from advancing into Punjab. 
And of course, having already played the Crimean War card, which is discarded permanently from the game, the Russians cannot move into any space where there's British Imperial strength points. The second action will be used by the British to send one strength point and march it to Herat. That is to prevent the Russians from advancing there also. The last action is used to move Abbott and his four strength points across the desert to Geoktepi to try to reduce the fortress there. The desert attrition roll is a three, reduced by one to two, and Abbott has four strength points, so only two are protected, so two strength points are lost in the march. That is certainly going to dash the British's hopes to reduce this fortress. The British roll a five modified to a four, and they have uh, two strength points, so uh, no losses are caused on the fortress. And the fortress with 13 strength points rolled a 13, so they caused no losses on the British. So the British have to retreat back to Merv, and that ends this fifth British round. And this is the situation at the end of round five. Now we go to the end of decade phase and we roll to see which officers leave and which remain. Only those that roll an odd die result will leave and those will be the ones that we will show. And Flashman, who's at Peshawar, leaves. And Kanikov also leaves. No other officers leave. Now let's take a look at the victory point situation. The Russians have their three home areas, so that's three victory points. They control three of the four spaces in Turkomans for six, plus the two spaces in Kiva, eight. The three in Bokhara for 11. One in Turkestan, Kokand, that's 12. And one, Kabul, in Afghanistan, which just reverted to neutrality, for a total of 13. The British have their four home spaces in the British Raj, so that's four. Plus four for Punjab, that's eight. Three in Baluchistan, and we're at 11. Plus one for Herat and one for Merv, so the British have 13 victory points. So the lines are starting to form with no further play of uh, Crimean War possible. The British have blocked passage into southern Afghanistan by way of Herat and Merv by placing strength points there. The Russians, however, could move south through Afghanistan and enter Baluchistan. Of course, that's if the British don't plug that gap first, and that depends also uh, how many uh, actions the Russians have. They would need at least three actions to move out of Afghanistan, or Afghanistan will be conquered and will have rebels there if there's a rebellion card to be played. So much more to happen in this playthrough of the great game. Also, the possibility of Kashgaria opening up and the British uh, may outflank the Russians, or the Russians may outflank the British, because each of the sides has already one High Asia card in play. So, stay tuned for the 1870 turn coming up. This is Tuka Joe signing off for now. Thanks for watching.